welcome to today's broadcast of North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of NIC television students and your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist Tony Stewart. Our major topic for discussion today involves genetic engineering, particularly giving emphasis to the field of agriculture. We'll also discuss some other topics such as Lyme disease. In order to carry out a discussion of these very interesting and important subjects, we're pleased to welcome to the program a member of the faculty at North Idaho College, Mr. Dick Raymond. Our guest holds the Bachelor of Science degree in the Biological Sciences from St. Cloud uh, Saint, uh, State University in Minnesota. He also holds a master's degree in the same field from the University of Montana. He has taught at North Idaho College for a number of years and is one of the most distinguished members of our faculty. And Dick, we're very happy to have you with us today. Thank you, Tony. Glad to be here. And as always, I'm very happy to welcome one of our regular panelists, uh, Steve Schink, who is Dean of College Relations and Community Development. And I shall ask Steve to commence the questioning. Thank you, Tony. Dick, could you give us a little bit more uh, information about your background, and particularly how that relates to the topic of, um, of genetic engineering? Well, first off, I would like to make it very clear I'm not a, a geneticist, per se, nor a genetic engineer. Uh, my undergraduate as well as my graduate degrees are in the biological sciences. I have had uh, a lot of graduate work following. I've also attended DNA seminars, institutes, uh, most recently at the uh, state uh, labs at uh, Washington State, not Washington State University now, but I'm talking about the state health labs of Washington State. Uh, a summer ago I attended the DNA Institute of just one day duration, but we covered a lot of things in regard to DNA fingerprinting, uh, the sophisticated techniques, not all of the uh, steps involved, but some of the sophisticated te techniques that would actually be involved with actually splicing out different sections of a DNA chromosome to actually match it with known DNA strands and this is the basis that they use to actually identify similar species or closely related species and some of the uh, well criminal cases that are now precedented where they have actually had a tissue or blood or a semen sample where they have actually been able to match a DNA strand, some of the components of DNA, with an unknown strand, and as a result, they've been able to, to make a match to some degree. Dick, um, maybe you'd take just a couple of minutes for the benefit of the people in the audience who are like me and have very little in the way of a science background and help us to find some of our terms. First, could you explain to us what genetic engineering really means? Okay, basically, in general, uh, some years ago, back in probably the later 50s or thereabouts, uh, some of the, not necessarily geneticists, but even the biochemists and some of the biologists were working in their lab with our common organism found in the intestinal tract called Escherichia coli. And this is a bacterial species of which is very common to all of us. We have it in our colon, which actually aids a little bit of digestion, water reabsorption. It also synthesizes a few vitamins. So in their research with E. coli, as it is commonly called, uh, some of the geneticists found that there were what are called restriction enzymes. Now, a restriction enzyme would be a biochemical enzyme that certain species, including bacteria, are capable of producing. Well, before they were aware of, they were actually finding that these restriction enzymes, if I could use my hands, uh, these restriction enzymes from, from one bacterial cell were capable of splicing different segments of the DNA chromosome out, not the whole chromosome, but little unique sections here and there. And these restriction enzymes were capable then of transplanting a gene from this chromosome onto another little piece of DNA, which beforehand they were not aware was in existence, called a plasmid. Now, normally all species of cells, plants, animals, including bacteria, have a chromosome, one or more, depending upon species. So what was maybe, happening? Maybe I should just stop you for a second there. You're going to have to get you're going to have to get real basic for me. And and I do think <coughs> if if you gave me the quick uh, bio, biology test, I could probably come up with some definitions. But you talk about DNA and chromosomes. Um, uh, um, could you t and genes? Could you just give us a real quick definition of each of those okay. terms you're going to be using throughout this? First of all, a chromosome is the whole genetic makeup for any particular species. Now that whole chromosome is the whole DNA molecule. Different unique segments or units of that are what we now commonly call genes. So any particular species has a specific gene for a specific trait. 
For example, in humans, we have a gene for eye color. We have a gene for hair color. Uh, unfortunately, we have some genes that kind of turn off and they don't produce much hair anymore, <laughs> uh, color or otherwise. So any particular characteristic or trait for any particular species has that unit segment of the chromosome, which is the gene. Okay. So then going back, and I didn't mean to get too involved, and uh, this is a very general description, these restriction enzymes were capable of splicing genes out of and putting them somewhere else. Now, then they found that they could take a gene out of one bacterial cell and put it into a different bacterial cell. Well, oddly enough, this is where gene splicing came into being. So splicing a gene means to take it out of one location and put it somewhere else. Now, these restriction enzymes that they have now identified in a variety of uh, cells, including E. coli, they now find they can take a gene out of not only a bacterial cell, but they can take a gene out of one of our human cells and maybe transplant it back into a bacterial cell. Now, this then give them, gave the basis for genetic engineering, and now that bacterial cell, although it normally does not have a human gene, now might specifically produce something of a human trait. And the obvious application of this would be the gene from a human cell that normally synthesizes insulin. So now we've got a bacterial species, E. coli, that now produces insulin. So one of the major methods of producing s insulin for diabetic, diabetics as such is to produce the insulin by way of a bacterial culture. So um, on, a, on a molecular level, this is a, this is a similar process to uh, grafting different kinds of branches on a tree? In a sense, yes. I see. Okay. But you're doing it at not only the molecular level, but the gene level of the whole mo molecule of DNA as such. Dick, we've heard so much about this in the last few years for mm -hmm. non-scientists, and we sometimes share it in a very direct or plain language, or sometimes even uh, in a sensational way. Uh, we hear about the creation of, uh, of uh, people that would be very much uh, similar or even identical to uh, the people that those uh, uh, cells might come from. I guess I want you to do something that would be very helpful to our audience, and that is, what are some of the potential uses of this DNA research in two ways? One, as to what it could do to human uh, advancement uh, physically, biologically, so forth, uh, or a clone of a person, and which has been a very sensational um, publicity that, that, that has received. And then secondly, in the field of agriculture, where you have some interest, what are some of the things can do? That's a very broad, general question, but I would just like to get some identity of the okay. possibilities. Let me kind of begin where you, your first part of that, Tony. Uh, in the field of, let's say, some of the human diseases, obviously we now have the sophisticated techniques to diagnose some of the diseases, like Down syndrome and so on. Some of the genetic abnormalities, we don't know what the actual cause is, but there's good, pretty good information that it's due to a gene in a chromosome, human chromosome now this, in this case, which evidently that gene is not functioning the way we normally mm -hmm. think it should. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as an application, well, I gave you one as far as the production of insulin. Mm -hmm. Now, in the field of not only antibiotics, but also some of the other medicinal compounds and drugs that certain diseases need, okay? Now, when I say certain diseases, certain abnormalities need to make a, an adjustment so the individual has normal, uh, I don't mean behavioral tendencies, but so they function biologically, metabolically, and so on. So in the field of genetic engineering, there is, it's, the gene tech field is wide open. It's merely the researchers that are gonna be able to develop those techniques of splicing a gene, a, a, a good, good, good gene, a healthy gene, into a bacterial species, or maybe potentially into a human that may correct that illness as such. And we're in the infancy stage of this, this research, I know. Right. But what you're saying leaves me with the impression that it may be the next giant step uh, that's beyond a lot of the medication that we can, with that kind of work within the system, maybe solve a lot of problems well, in the field of disease. It's like anything else. We talk about it, and we tend to generalize and oversimplify. You know, it would be nice to cure some of these diseases as such. Mm -hmm. And even James Watson, who is a prime researcher in, still in the field of genetics and DNA and also in <coughs> cancer, uh, who is at Long Island, uh, oh, uh, Cold Spring Harbor on Long, Long Island in New York. And their main center of research is in the field of not only cancer, but also the possibility of maybe being able to synthesize some of these chemicals 
that they now know are not functioning properly in people that have certain brain disorders, uh, schizophrenics. They have now found and identified some of the endocrine secretions of various glands as well as the brain uh, called endorphins, whether the term is uh, kind of complex, which it is. Uh, but the brain is capable, in a normal sense, of producing these. In fact, when you talk of an endorphins, one of them is morphine. And morphine, obviously, is a painkiller. While well, your brain does synthesize this normally and naturally, and evidently your body does not need much. So the idea of maybe correcting those illnesses by producing that medical compound that our biochemists may never be able to do and synthesize in the lab itself. Mm -hmm. So quite possibly we may generate, if you will, or, or not, uh, produce, let's say, by gene splicing, a common bacterial species that may be able to produce those chemical compounds that may alleviate some of our mental disorders. Uh, when you talk about some of the mental disorders, uh, you know, the, the field is, I don't mean totally wide open, but some of them we know are due to an imbalance in some of the hormonal secretions throughout the body as far as functioning in a steady state. One final question, and then back to Steve, but we also could change the physical makeup of individuals. Could we not the size and the, whether they're taller or shorter? Okay, or now there again, we kind of, I don't mean joke about this, where we could generate, you know, a bunch of seven-foot basketball players mm -hmm. and so on. Well, even James Watson, uh, he kind of, jokes and laughs about this when he is questioned because he was on a Donahue interview uh, show a, a few years back and of course Donahue asked him something about this as far as what about producing the perfect human being and so on and he said well we talk about it and it sounds easy and but it's it's still difficult he said I don't know how to do that and then Donahue would say well you gave us all this the structure of DNA why don't you fix it well he would jokingly say I don't know how and you know, in a nutshell, it's, it seems very simplistic when we talk about it, but we're talking about structures that are on the molecular level, atomic level, and so on, and to try to rearrange these things. Uh, some of the diseases, we don't know where the error is in the gene. We think it is in a gene as such. Thank you. Steve? Dick, it's, it is fun to talk about the, the future of, of uh, genetic engineering, <coughs> but maybe from a practical standpoint, it would be more beneficial to talk uh, about what's actually being done today. And I'm sure there are applications for genetic engineering that we take for granted as, as part of everyday life. Could you explain some of those? Okay. Uh, our life science division at North Idaho, we have a newsletter that I just happen to be the editor of. And uh, last, well, second semester in the spring semester, I did have a few excerpts of some of the things that have been done in the field of agriculture. Uh, some of, like Quaker oats, they are now by way of gene splicing, they are splicing good and healthy genes into their oat plants where the oat plant bears a better head of seed to produce the Quaker Oats product as such. And some of the other features of genetic engineering that have been beneficial in the field of agriculture, they are now producing uh, tomato species which are resistant to certain hornworm insect larval stages. And as a result, uh, by way of genetic engineering, not only a better yield of the crop, but also more resistant to diseases, whether fungal diseases, insect pests, and even in the field of agriculture also, they are now splicing genes into some of these apparent crop plant type species where they not only produce a better seed crop, but they also don't need as much fertilizer, don't, they don't need as much water. So for example, when you talk about, well, what about if we have a drought? Well, they are now coming up with the idea that we can now generate by gene splicing certain plants where they will grow even better with 40 percent less rainfall. And obviously that would be a benefit to the farmers, especially in this particular area as far as wheat and so on. Uh, there's a couple of researchers at the at Washington State, WSU, Washington State University, that are doing research in this particular field. Dick, it seems to me that there that there is or used to be a, a stockyard outside of Denver, Colorado. Uh, that had a big genetic engineering or genetic research sign on the outside of it. What about in the field of, of, uh, of livestock? Is okay, the same way there, they have done some work uh, with, in the field of genetic engineering with producing not only livestock that yields the meat product quicker, also the egg product quicker, in a sense, if you follow what I mean, mm -hmm. and also in the case of poultry, uh, the, they can be raised for the market quicker 
In other words, they seem to have a more rapid rate of growth, and they seem to be less susceptible to certain diseases. And in the case of uh, egg crops, the, the chickens that lay the eggs, they, I don't mean they produce bigger eggs or golden eggs per se, but they evidently can produce eggs uh, more rapidly as such. In other words, a more efficient production line as far as food supply. Let me make sure I understand something. And I was thinking back to my high school biology days and remember a fellow named, I think it was, was it Mendel, who uh, a monk uh, somewhere who, who pioneered research into uh, recessive genes and dominant genes and that sort of thing. What's the difference? Now, on the one hand, we're talking about gene splicing. On the other hand, we for years have been crossbreeding species of cattle or uh, or, or strains of uh, of uh, some kind of a plant. Are, th is, are these two different sciences we're talking no, about? No, no. Basically, we're talking about the same basic principles, Mendelian genetics. The feature with bacteria, uh, as compared to many of the other species, bacteria and some of the other unicellular microorganisms, as such, have but a single chromosome. So, in the case of other species, like most species of plants, most species of animals. Uh, which those species are the apparent result of producing offspring by way of sexual reproduction, they have pairs of chromosomes. So, for example, in us we have 23 pairs of which we received one chromosome of each pair from each of our parents, of which from those pair of chromosomes, which are homologs or homologous as such, then we start talking about dominant genes and recessive genes, which was one of the Mendelian principles. But when you talk about dominant genes and combine it with a recessive gene, uh, and I realize I'm using two fingers, but let's suppose my long finger, if you will, would be the dominant gene, and I got this from one of my parents, and I got the recessive gene from the other parent. Well, those two genes, per se, are for the same trait, or those two chromosomes, okay? But one of the genes is recessive. Now, it's still there, but it's not going to show itself, so what will show itself in that trait will be the dominant gene here, okay? And as a result, uh, we have already asserted that certain gene traits are dominant as compared to recessive, like eye color, hair color. Uh, a good example, believe it or not, is what is commonly called hitchhiker's thumb. And it's the extended bending of the thumb like this. Now, I don't know if you have that trait or not. Many, t if you don't have it, well, Steve doesn't have it. In other words, even if he would, as much as he would try to stretch that thumb, it won't go back in that particular trait. Now, this is due to a dominant and a recessive trait. So if you have it, you can do it. If you don't have it, you can't do it, in a sense. So when you talk about gene splicing, um, we're really taking mm -hmm. the, the old uh, practice of, of breeding, let's say livestock, for a particular desired trait and trying to accelerate that very, very dramatically and also developing the tools to, to really fine-tune that process. Okay, but in the case now of livestock, we again have the, uh, the resulting offspring as a result of sexual reproduction. Mm -hmm. So we would have to gene splice a desirable gene into both parents, per se. Oh. So that then, now if that gene is a dominant one, we would have less worry. If it would combine with the recessive, it would still express itself. But in the case of gene splicing, in the case of cattle, now most of the uh, feeds, uh, feel in the field of agriculture, most of the gene splicing has been done with plants. Now does that give you a tip or a clue? Evidently, it's a little bit easier to work with plants so far than it is with animals. Not that animals won't come next, let's hope. But in the field of, <coughs> excuse me, some of these uh, medical compounds that Tony asked about, see, we can take and culture certain types of cells, and then we can splice a desirable gene out of one of those, like a pancreatic cell, which, which does have the normal insulin gene. Now, we wouldn't necessarily transplant that back into another human, we'd put it into a bacterial cell that would now make the insulin. Now, in that same field, and this would kind of go back to Tony's original question to kind of improve the human being, there we may see the time, let's hope, where they might be able to take a good gene for insulin, if you pardon the expression, good gene, by way of bacterial culturing, and grow a lot of those bacterial cells that now have the insulin gene, okay? Then maybe in a manner of injecting those cells, those bacterial cells, may be into a pancreatic region where maybe those bacterial cells would then automatic, and when I say automatically, okay, and this is due to those uh, restriction enzymes, maybe some of those bacterial cells may splice the insulin gene they have back into a good pancreatic cell. Now, going on the premise then that maybe from some of those pancreatic cells, an abnormal pancreas that is, has the inability of producing insulin 
may over a period of time, because those cells reproduce themselves in our body. Mm -hmm. So we might wind up with an, an individual who is diabetic, who maybe later on after, well, we don't know how long, might be able to produce at least a little bit of insulin to counteract their own deficiency. We're running sense. fairly short on time, and we promised our viewers we'd talk about something else called Lyme disease, and there's a report at the time of the taping of this program that it's appeared now in North Idaho. Would you briefly explain to our viewers what the Lyme disease is and how that uh, could okay. be obtained? Lyme disease, Tony, uh, was kind of unknown. They didn't even know the causative agent until about 19, well, later 70s. And a research team in Lyme, Connecticut, I believe, okay, evidently diagnosed the causative agent and they found that it was a bacterial organism. Mm -hmm. Now, the uh, disease organism, the bacteria, is carried by a type of wood tick. Mm -hmm. And it's common to, well, it's common to a variety of animals, especially the deer. And it's not the classic little brown, little scale-like wood tick that most of us are probably familiar with. Uh, it evidently goes through a number of instar or larval type stages where the insect is quite small. And it looks like just a little brown speck. So if anyone ever has uh, a tick that looks abnormal, other than just the classic wood tick, but it seems to have burrowed in the skin, they should be a little suspicious. It may be the tick, and I forget the genus and species of that particular tick, but it may be carrying the bacterial organism that causes Lyme disease. Now, the bite is typical like an ordinary wood tick bite as far as uh, taking a blood meal. But within a matter of a few days or maybe a week to 10 days, there will tend to be a classic kind of a uh, target type rash. In other words, kind of a red center with a ring around. Now, usually this will show up somewhere close to where the bite was, and that classic target shape rash is an indication that it is Lyme disease. Do you acquire some of the symptoms of that? Okay, fever, uh, pit, uh, fever pitch, uh, maybe a little bit nauseous, uh, uh, swelling, reddening. That target rash is the classic uh, mm -hmm. uh, symptom as such. And right now, uh, they can catch it before it gets too far, and it can be treated quite, quite easily, if you know what I mean, with certain antibiotics. I forget exactly which one right offhand. But if it's not caught early, the rash will tend to go away, and the individual seems to recover, and no problem. But there is a, a, not an after effect, but then kind of a, a duration time where after a period of several weeks, the person will again break out in uh, chills, fever, uh, not feel well, and it seems more like the flu. And this can go on and get very serious. And as a result, there will be kind of a long-lasting effect that the person, I don't mean harbors the disease indefinitely, but it's like some of the other diseases like malaria and so on. There's a possibility that they never totally rid the body of the organism as far as the effect of. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Steve? Is it a life-threatening disease, Dick? Uh, I don't know right offhand if there are any deaths recorded to Lyme disease. Since 1975 or the later 70s, uh, there have been a number of cases. In fact, uh, as far away as Australia, they have actually identified the same causative organism, a similar tick in that particular area. And uh, I think, as Tony mentioned, more recently, a young girl, four-year-old girl, yeah. I think at Sandpoint, just recently in the papers, uh, evidently the father was very conscious took it to even uh, a general practitioner and he was very conscious and it was diagnosed uh, with, by way of some tests as Lyme disease. Now earlier there were, I forget how many cases, there were a few cases down in southern Idaho as such. Other than being aware of the <clears throat> symptoms and seeking treatment quickly if you suspect you've got Lyme disease, what, is there anything you can do to try to keep from getting it? Well, watch for ticks mainly, you know, as far as those of us that are out in the... Use a spray or... Well, I'm not totally certain repellent? if some of the repellents are effective in regard to ticks or not right offhand as such. Uh, the main thing, if you're out in the woods or work in the woods as far as logging and so on, or as far as summer recreation, uh, probably classically check your clothing, especially where your clothing and your arm, where the, the body is still warm, mm -hmm. and also where the ticks will tend to migrate to where the body is quite warm. Well, I want to make sure we got that in before the time was up, but since we have a little more time, I would like to go back a little bit to the agricultural issues and again we're uh, on a frontier that's very exciting as you were telling us some of the things that could happen within production and needing less rainfall and so forth wouldn't this just revolutionize the whole uh, issue of food around the world where in Africa and Asia and places there's been such hunger that maybe those places where there is more drought and so forth that more food could be produced and that this may be a partial answer to 
some of the poverty in the world? By all means, Tony. I think, you know, any time we talk about drought condition, no matter what the, what the food crop is, the farmers and the ranchers and so on are always looking for if there's going to be enough rainfall, let alone rainfall at all. So if we can generate species of plants, per se, that don't need as much water, and by the way, some of the other features, they have also found that some of these plants don't need as much fertilizer. So if we can restrict the fertilizer and the fungicides that are used to treat these fields when the plant, when they, well, when the crop is planted, we can probably do away with a lot of our other uh, problems as far as water pollution and uh, uh, reservoir, uh, let's say reservoir buildup of some of our toxic materials from fertilizers, chemical compounds, and so on. So when we hear uh, reports, and we've had some of those even on the symposium here, that there is tremendous danger and this is going to get out of the lab and there should be a lot of legislation passed to prevent this kind of research, how would you react to that charge? Well, I think any of us in the science field, we should be cautious to some degree. Uh, one of the features that even uh, James Watson himself, uh, when he was interviewed by Donahue a couple of years ago, uh, Donahue asked him the same question, aren't you afraid that something's going to get out of the window of your lab and out into society and so on? Well, uh, fortunately, and I mean this very honestly and realistically, the organism that they have done so much research with is almost as common as the human species, E. coli. They have, they have taken the, the whole chromosome out of the cell, they have almost identified all the genes, and I know we're talking about something that is so small that's almost impossible to comprehend, most of us. But they have identified all the traits, and they've worked out all the good points as well as the bad points. And when you talk about genetic engineering, I think there's some reason to be concerned, but not to the point where something is going to wind up being science fiction, you know, big and three eyes and four noses and, you know, and the bark of the night or the, the whole moon or whatever, or full moon, yeah. I should say, I guess. Steve, we have about two minutes left. Uh, quickly, Dick, what about, uh, and you touched on it just a moment ago, you, you know, we talk about plants and animals, and I think there's a, one level of concern. You talk about human, uh, human genetic engineering, and it raises, I think, a, a host of ethical and moral questions. Uh, do those concern you? Are there groups out there who are actively opposed to any kind of research in, to human genetic engineering? Well, yeah. since I've been here at the college, uh, I know I got a, uh, a bulletin, I'm certain from the administration, that if I was doing any research or any experiments in genetic engineering, I was supposed to acknowledge what I was doing and actually outline what I was doing, what my plan of attack was, and so on. Well, those policies that were federally legislated as such have now gone down, if you know what I mean. In other words, uh, I don't mean that there aren't some uh, basic principles that researchers have to still work within, but the alarm concern, see originally, the researchers themselves said, hey, we should be worried. Well, then they realized they shouldn't have to be worried in a sense, and as a result, now how do you convince everyone to believe yeah. us now? So sorry to interrupt, we could go on and on. You have been most informative, and I know our viewers have found this one of our more informative programs. We thank you very much for being here, Dick. My pleasure, Tony. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you've enjoyed our program. I'd like to invite you to be with us again next week at this same time. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at the same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by an NIC student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.